ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My guest today is Deacon Larry Oni. Deacon Larry, great to be with you. Same here, Matthew. Thank you. You're coming to us from Louisiana today? Well, not just Louisiana, the great city of New Orleans, as we like to say, <laughs> the Big Easy down by the Mississippi River. Yeah. I'm glad <laughs> to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. I was I was at the Super Bowl. Wow. When uh uh when New Orleans won the Super Bowl. Wow, that was an electric moment for the community. Yeah. It was an amazing thing. And it, 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 they just come back uh, with that that onside kick. Yes. Okay. And the whole energy in that stadium. Yes. Changed so market. Like you felt the momentum of the game shift. Absolutely. It's one of the most extraordinary live sporting experiences i've ever had and um so welcome from thank you great city of uh of new orleans we're uh preparing to you know make our journey to indianapolis for the national eucharistic congress but before we get into that tell us just a little bit about yourself about your ministry about your life uh thank you so much matthew so uh, the ministry is Hope and Purpose Ministries. I'm a deacon in the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Um, uh, 15 years, just celebrated 15 years now. So, and mainly our ministry is about expanding the kingdom of God. So we have a ministry of the word about healing the brokenhearted and giving people a sense of hope and purpose for their lives. And that manifests itself. That's the three foundations of what we're about. Kingdom expansion is number one, healing the brokenhearted and giving people a sense of hope and purpose for their lives, helping people to find out what am I supposed to be doing at this moment upon the earth uh, and get busy doing it because God has created us to do something with a great purpose for our lives. And we try and help people to find that. So that's basically what we do. And that manifests itself in a little school that we have in East Africa and a farm we have in West Africa and feeding the hungry on the streets here in New Orleans. So that's that's a little bit about what we do. And I serve at, at, my, at the local church here as a deacon. Fantastic. I, I have to point out that you've had a massively successful business career um, which you didn't mention. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us a little bit about what inspired you to begin this ministry with your wife, Andy, and yes. uh, and, and become a deacon. Well, you know, I, I mentioned the business last because I had to learn this, Matthew, because to me, and I tell all the executives in our little company, uh, God has blessed us. We've had some success that the business does not operate so people can get paychecks. And that's that's a goal. That's a derivative. But really, the business exists to support the mission. But I had to first find out what is my divine mission? What's my purpose upon the earth? So it's the other way. And that's different than the, it is in the secular world. It's like, oh, no, business is everything. No, the ministry is first. We need resources for this mission. And the, the top guys and girls, they understand it. We have that conversation every year. So, you know, we, 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 we're, we're thankful for all of our employees. We've got about 50 employees. So it's a small business, but it, 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 we use it to kind of do the work that God has allowed us to do and he's called us to do. So, yeah. And, but to be a deacon, God called me a long time ago. I wanted to be a deacon at 31. They said, you're too young. Uh, and then about 20 years later, finally God acquiesced and I acquiesced and said, all right, it's time. So again, 15 years, I've been a deacon and uh, I have the privilege to minister with my wife with the proclamation of the word and uh, to, to to raise up uh, people who have great needs. So that's our ministry. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's our work. Really beautiful. As we uh, get ready to go to uh, Indianapolis, what are you most excited about as the um, Eucharistic Congress draws near? Well, I'm excited that the first time that I know of that the bishops, the USCCB, the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, have used the word revival. Matthew, I think that we're at an inflection point right now in this nation, but upon the earth. So yeah. they've used the word revival. And I was just reflecting, knowing that you would ask that question, thinking about, well, uh, I'm looking forward to see what the Holy Spirit will do. Uh, but I think we're in a Joel chapter one, chapter two moment where there was such great problems upon the land. Judah had a swarm of uh, locusts and, and, and God raised up a prophet. And I think he's raising up people today. I mean, look at this. I'm talking to the great Matthew Kelly. Think about that for a minute, for a second. Uh, but God raising up people, some known, some not known, to speak a prophetic word to the church. And Joel says, gather the people notify the congregation, gather the elders, gather the children, uh, blow the trumpet. All of that's been done. 
somebody complain, oh, too much money being spent. No, we have to gather the people. But I think this, this, this is the really coup de grace, as they say. Let the priest between the porch and the altar weep and cry out for God. Mm. I, it, it's a moment of crying out for our nation, for our families, for our own personal sin. That's what we've been doing, been crying out and said, Lord, we're guilty crying out for the nation. We're doing that this morning. And it was that adoration went on our face. That's what we can do. And one person can do that because one person crying out to the Lord can change the course of a nation. And we need that right now. We had a moment of revival like no other. That's beautiful. You will be um, serving as MC, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really unique role. I've spoken thousands of conferences over the last 30 years, and um, this, this is such an important role. It can, it can tee up a session for success. And then transitioning from one speaker to the next speaker gives you that opportunity to uh, reinforce um, you know, what the, the previous speaker has said and then also prepare the hearts for, for the next speaker. How are you preparing for this role? And, uh, and what are your thoughts about this role? Well, you know, we all, we didn't get the invitation until two or three months after Bishop Cousins sent it out. I believe that the Holy Spirit wanted us knuckleheads, uh, uh, Deacon Larry and Andy, for some reason. So finally, two or three months later, uh, the assistant said, hey, you got this note here from Bishop Cousin. Uh, I said, but it's three months old. Something happened, but we got it. And then we called. I said, call. Are you still available? We're available. Uh, are you available? Wait a minute. We want you guys to MC the mission track. Wait a minute. We're made for mission. That's what we're all about. Absolutely, we'll do that. So we're 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 a part of a big a bigger wheel. But God is raising up people. We're preparing by praying for the speakers, praying for uh, a moment of real revival, Eucharistic and otherwise. God is calling His people back to Himself. We are a Eucharistic people. We're an Easter people too. But God is saying, "Hey, I need individuals to cry out." for themselves, for their families, and for the nation. So we've been trying, we've been doing that before the announcement of the Eucharistic uh, Congress, but now uh, our, our prayer is focused. So we're crying out for the speakers. We're crying out for the delegates, those who will be making a pilgrimage. So we've just been getting on our face and saying, Lord, have mercy upon us for our sins, uh, uh, as Amos says, our crimes uh, for the nation and for the whole world. It's a moment now that's focused, but in particular praying for our nation and for the church. That, that 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 by the power of doing what uh, uh, is said in uh, Second Chronicles chapter seven, uh, when when Solomon uh, dedicated the temple uh, and he went in before the Lord and said, "Lord, look, if we sin against you, can we? Will you meet us in this place? I think we're in a place like that now because Matthew, you know, and your listeners know probably well, our nation is in a little bit of a trouble, more than a little bit, big time trouble." We're almost living in a pagan society. So we're saying we're crying out for the nation, but first we're starting with ourselves and said, Lord, we're sinful. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on our region. Have mercy on our city. Have mercy on our nation. And then have mercy on the whole world. So that's what we've been doing uh, with a very uh, focused manner, doing that and being in the presence of God every day as often as we can, being mindful about repentance and crying out. That's beautiful. Uh, share with us a little bit about your own faith journey and and in particular your experience with the Eucharist and and when did the Eucharist when did you get it I, I find that most people have a moment yeah you know, even if they were baptized as infants they have a moment when they they get it around the Eucharist share a little bit of your journey with us well you know I I I was not baptized as an infant I was baptized nothing I was a people said oh you're a convert no I was just a heathen uh, and then God found me. Uh, and, and I remember a friend of mine, uh, uh, some friends, they set up a retreat for me. I'm, I'm unchurched. Uh, 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 and, and they said, well, you're going on this retreat. And I said, I think I'm going to be sick that day. But somehow God got me on the retreat. But, but God had been stirring in my heart and in my life, Matthew. And this young man uh, on the uh, crossing the Mississippi River of all places on a ferry, he said, God has been looking for you. Now, that mm. happened close in time when I'm on this retreat. I know nothing about the Eucharist, but I'm reading John, <laughs> uh, where it says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. But if you do eat my flesh and drink my blood, I'll raise you up on the last day. I'm reading the Bible. I'm reading the scripture. The conversion happened there. All of that is coming together. And then I saw these women going to communion 
with reverence and something stirred in me. I had no intention of joining the Catholic, being a Catholic, no intention of staying there. I was trying to say, when is this retreat going to be over? I'm watching my watch. But then I believe it's a sovereign move of God. God had prepared the ground of my heart to receive. And I knew then that the Eucharist was real and I desired a great thirst welled up in me. And so uh, a long story forward, I did come into the church at around 22, 23 years old. Uh, but I, I, that's been a long journey. So that's that's my experience with the Eucharist. I knew it at the moment of that retreat. Didn't fully know, but God created a hunger in my heart. And so here I am going to a Eucharistic Congress. That's beautiful. How how old were you at that time? I was in my early 20s. Yeah, okay. my early 20s. Mm -hmm. and, right after um, college. And then uh, when did you meet your wife? And, and it, was she Catholic? Uh, my wife uh, was Catholic. Definitely, I give credit where it's due. Brought me to a lot of people who did know the faith, though. Uh, in particular, a deacon uh, who drove for an hour or two hours for several years to catechize me. Of course, I didn't know what catechesis was, but he was sharing the faith with me uh, and sharing the scripture with me. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I probably that's why I'm a deacon today. He really Powerful. sowed into my life, into my heart. Powerful. Yeah. When did you When did you know that? a call was upon your life to become a deacon? Well, it was shortly thereafter. Uh, I mean, I just felt this burning, uh, the love for scripture, the, uh, the zeal in my heart. Uh, so I was 30, 30 years old and I made the inquiry and they said, you're too young. Uh, uh, I was disappointed that answer, but I understand the wisdom of it now. But I believe that God is really calling people at inconvenient times right now. Mm. I think that because of the state that we're in upon the earth right now, I don't think God is waiting for, oh, you're retired now. You've been in the KCs for 20 years. Uh, you, 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 everything is set. No, 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 no. There's such an urgency now. It's kind of like a Joel moment. Uh, mm. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Uh, yeah. Notify the congregation. Uh, gather the elders. Get the priests together and let them weep between the porch and the altar, you know, there's not only altar on your faces before you go up to the Holy of Holies, the sacred space. It's a time for weeping and crying out, Matthew. That's beautiful. How is being a deacon different than what you thought it would be? Well, uh, I have some good examples of deacons, but still, when you get to stand beside the priest of the Most High God, and once you know that the power of God, epiclesis, when the elements of bread and wine are laid on the altar of God and the fire of God is coming down to transform the bread and the wine, real power, and you're there. That's why we deacons stand back a little bit. The power of God is coming down and that you're gonna be, you're gonna eat that bread and wine that is now the body, the blood, soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we're up close to the action of God. It's overwhelming. What can I say? I can't find the right words to describe to you, but I know that I'm privileged to be there assisting the priest at the altar because I believe that a supernatural thing is happening and I'm, I'm a little part of it. Yeah. 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 When, you, when you have the opportunity to preach, what, what do you want uh, the people to be thinking and feeling after you're finished? Uh, that they have, that the preach word is a part of the whole worship of God. That is the Eucharist, the body, the blood, the soul, divinity of Jesus, and the word made flesh is one common table and part of the worship of the Lord. I, I, I mean, we have to eat from we're eating from the single table. So I want them to know that, did you eat? And sometimes I'll exhort the people, uh, don't rush to the second part of the meal. It's all one meal. Eat this word, open your heart, open your mouth and eat this. And then there's more. Uh, uh, we, we, we eat the Eucharist, but we also eat the word. And if I've done that, then I've done my job as a preacher. You know, I was on with Scott Hahn a couple of years ago uh, in our book on preaching Jesus in the time of the new evangelization which I'll be sharing with some deacons from across the country uh, in a couple of days. He says that one of the great needs, uh, he, an argument we made that one of the greatest needs in the church is better preaching. So I take preaching very seriously. We must, the proclamation of the word to point people to the Eucharist uh, is all part of what God is doing upon the earth right now. Mm, that's fantastic. I, um, 
for 25 years, I used to lead groups on uh, pilgrimage. Um, Holy Land, Fatima, yeah. Lourdes, uh, Rome, Assisi, different places like this. And it was it was a big part of my life for 25 years. But when I when my children were very little, I decided I would take a break from this specific part of the ministry. And um, but I'm I'm preparing to take a group to to Fatima in in October, and and in preparing for that, I've also been thinking about okay, we we've got this experience in Indianapolis coming up, and when I take a group on pilgrimage. Um, you know, the first thing I talk to them about that that first get together, uh, I say to them, you know, you you got to make a decision, and and the first decision you have to make on this trip is, um, are you going to be a pilgrim or are you going to be a tourist? And uh, you can you can come on a pilgrimage but still be a tourist, and um, or you can come on a pilgrimage and and you can learn um, what it means to be a pilgrim. Mm. And and understand that okay, we're making this sacred journey for seven days, and that's great. But the reality is, is life is a pilgrimage. We are all pilgrims, and and the mind and, and attitude of a pilgrim is is very different to that of a tourist, and very different to that of you know the average person just out in society today. Um, as we make this journey to uh, Indianapolis. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming from all over. And uh, I'm sure some of them are thinking, okay, I'm going to a congress or I'm going to a conference and I'm going to be an attendee or I'm going to be a participant. But we want them to put on the mind the heart of a pilgrim, right? Amen. Um, but what attitude would you encourage people who are coming to Indianapolis what attitude would you encourage them towards as they prepare for, for that journey? If there's one thing that I can say about we as Catholic Christian people, we have low expectation. The attitude that I would say, be open for a surprise of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the music is playing uh, in the church when uh, the priests uh, coming, uh, persona Christi Capitus, up to the altar with hopefully a, a holy deacon uh, coming at persona Christi Servi in the person of Christ a servant. Uh, the music, we're, there's a, like in, back when Jesus made his triumphal entry, uh, the expectation was high. I would say, raise your level of expectation to a supernatural level. People say, oh, well, I don't know. That sounds awfully Pentecostal. I'll say this. We Catholics are the original Pentecostals, Matthew. Amen. I mean, we were Amen, Pentecostal brother. before it was cool. I mean, it, and so now raise that level. If we believe, and I know not all of us do, that the Eucharist, Truly, the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ, the only way that can happen is through the a miracle of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit coming down. Well, if we can believe for that, let's believe for other outbreaks of miracle and a revival and a resurgence of the things of God for this Congress. Why not? That, that we can call down the mercy of God, ask God to send his mercy, and our nation would be revived and renewed and, 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 and our land would be healed. Why, why, why can't we elevate our expectations to that level? That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I would say. Go as a pilgrim looking for the supernatural, looking for something to happen. And and, and in you too. And I think I'm, not, I'm saying is open yourself up for a surprise of the Holy Spirit is, is what I would say. Amen. I think there's going to be thousands and thousands of them. <laughs> I think in so Indianapolis. too. I think so too. Deacon Larry, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your service to the church. And I look forward to seeing you in Indianapolis. Looking forward to it, brother. God bless you. God bless you. I have a dream. These are among the most quoted words in the English language outside of the Bible. They are the words of Martin Luther King Jr. If he had stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on that hot summer's day in 1963 and said, I have a plan, would the speech have become one of the most memorable speeches of all time? I don't think so. The ability to dream is uniquely human and an extraordinary gift. This God-given ability to look into the future and imagine something better and then return to the present and work to bring about that better future is a remarkable gift. And yet sadly, it is massively unemployed 
in most people's lives. Think of it for a moment. When was the last time you used your God-given ability to chase down a personal dream? When was the last time together as Catholics we had a common dream and pursued it with relentless passion? I believe it is time we all started dreaming again. It is time for Catholics to move beyond the sense of defeatism holding us back to envision new, bold possibilities and to work together in a collaboration with God to make those dreams a reality. So let me tell you a little about my dream and then perhaps it can become our dream. I have a dream that the whole world would be consecrated to the Eucharist. One person at a time, one marriage at a time, one family at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one parish at a time, one diocese at a time, one country at a time. The whole world consecrated to Jesus in the Eucharist. This new book, 33 Days to Eucharistic Glory, is the first step to making that dream a reality. It is the first ever Eucharistic consecration. It's an unprecedented invitation to make an unconditional surrender to Jesus in the Eucharist and experience an explosion of grace in your life. Order your copy today and join us in the dream to consecrate the whole world to the Eucharist. It is a bold dream, but isn't that what is needed at this time in history? Be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid, was Goethe's insight. Those mighty forces are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all the angels and saints. Isn't it time Catholics did something bold? Isn't it time we did something bold together? It is my fervent hope that this dream will help fuel your dreams. And together, as Catholics, we will become a people of possibility again. So join us. Be one of the first people in history to experience this Eucharistic consecration. Order it now for yourself and anyone in your life who needs to dream again. And remember, be bold, be Catholic. Hi, I'm Matthew Kelly, and I hope you are enjoying the spiritual pilgrimage. The response to 33 days to Eucharistic glory has been amazing. As a result, we've decided to host a very special retreat in Fatima this October to consecrate America and the world to the Eucharist. I will personally host this retreat and I'm looking forward to taking some of my children to Fatima for the very first time to participate in this retreat also. We'll also be joined by a host of other speakers, bishops and priests. Our goal is to have someone to represent every country in the world present for this world consecration. We host almost a dozen pilgrimages each year, but this will be the first time in seven years I have personally attended a pilgrimage. I would like to personally invite you to join us in Fatima this October for this extraordinary event. Visit Fatima2024.com to learn more.